The world has changed, if you aren't aware. Changed profoundly. The paradigm of success from my father's generation was get a job, stay in that job for 40 plus years, hate it or not, endure it as an act of faithfulness and compliance, and then after you retire, you can start doing stuff you love to do. Like move to Florida, live in a condo that will be blown away by the next hurricane. <laughs> but we live in a world now where we are at least beginning to understand a little bit better our relationship to work. That economies change, everything begins to change, and our work has more meaning, I think, than it used to. Maybe that's why one of the worst things that can happen to you still today is to be fired. But here's the truth. Chances are in your working lifetime, you will lose a job, be fired from a job for cause, or be fired from a job for no cause whatsoever. Or find your place trapped in a job that you, for which you have no passion. We're going to talk about that next week. A hell called, I hate my job. Today we want to talk about what I think is a growing phenomenon around us. And that is, what happens when you wake up one day in a hell called, services no longer required. I have been working since I was 11 years old. Go ahead, we'll, we'll answer that and give them their credit card number so we can tithe on that. Leave it to a pastor to think of that, right? Excuse me. Started as a paper boy. Uh, work was always a part of my life, has always been a part of my life. And in, the, in, in my working life, I have never been fired but once. And in my experience, once is enough. <laughs> Being fired, I think, helps you understand what most people go through. When I was fired uh, very publicly several years ago, what I really began to learn is how much for granted I had taken the privilege I had of doing something I love continuously without going through the pain and the disruption of being fired. It gave me more compassion and sympathy for those who had lost the privilege of doing what they felt was their life's work and gave me some perspectives that I want to share with you this morning. I came to understand personally why we fear being fired. When, when Donald Trump on The Apprentice says, you're fired, every time I hear it, there's something in me that recoils just a little bit. It is such a painful statement. Let me give you some suggestions why. First, we all fear being rejected. We all fear someone saying to us, we don't want you here anymore. For whatever the reason is, the markets have changed, we're downsizing. You can give any explanation, but when you lose a job, when you're forced out of a job, there, it, it, we go back to that primal fear, fear of rejection. That's ultimately what Christianity is, has such a genius because it goes to the heart of our core fear, the core fear of being turned out. Our, our parents were turned out, right? They were turned out of the garden. So it is in our DNA to fear being turned away or turned out or not being chosen, not being picked. Secondly, there's the fear of failing. And failing in a way that is not private. It's not failing at Monopoly or failing at Pickup Sticks. It's not failing at Rook or failing at, you know, it's failing publicly where other people can observe and form their opinions of us. People who don't know us say things about us that are so painful that we never thought would ever be said about us, only those people on TV. 
Fear of failing, though, is something that we have always conquered in our life. Think about it. When I was born, I know you're not going to, this is going to be hard for you to swallow, but when I was born, truthfully, I did not know my name. I had no hair, no teeth. I, could, I had to be carried everywhere I went, and I couldn't feed myself. But look at me now. <laughs> I know my name. I know where I am. I have no hair. <coughs> All the way through life, we have been failing and getting up, failing and getting up. When we first walked, we fell down and we got up, right? We get knocked down, but we get up again. We get knocked down. We always know. But when we become adults, somehow we lose that gene that, that says, you know what? Everyone fails. You're only a failure when you fail to get back up. Amen? Everyone fails. Doesn't make you, let me say, doesn't make it any less painful when it's your failure, when it's you in the middle of it. I'm not saying it does. When your marriage fails, it's painful. Don't tell me why I went through, I had an uncle who went through it. Well, what did he do? You know, it's your pain at that moment. There's also the fear, I think maybe if you really just scrape it all down and just say, what is the true fear at the core of, what is the true fear? thing that makes being fired such a hell on earth. And that's the fear of humiliation. I mean, this is the thing we fear more than anything. We do not want to be humiliated. Ladies, how many of you fret and, and work to put your makeup on, get your look right? I mean, you don't want to go anywhere unless you're dressed in a way where you feel good about yourself, Right? Ladies, tell me, am I right? Yes. Nothing wrong with it. I'm not criticizing. Men are the same way. We just have a lower standard. Can I hear an amen? I'm <laughs> not saying we should. I'm just saying we do. So, that, you know, we, we know what this is like. We hate it. We, we don't want to go anywhere where we don't feel comfortable. We don't want to go anywhere where we don't know people because we don't want to feel stupid, Right? Fear of humiliation, and yet Christianity, again, at the very heart of the genius of Christianity, we're the only major world religion that has <coughs> as its central theme the humiliation of our God. Christ humbled himself. He, hum he allowed him to be humiliated. Humiliation and humility are part and parcel of what is required to walk with God. And yet none of us invites public humiliation. People to stand in judgment of us. People to condemn us and to criticize us. We re re recoil from it. I've heard people say, I, my mother used to say, this is honest truth, no hair in this. She can't defend herself, but I'm telling the truth. Mm -hmm. David, when you, when you learn how to swim, you can go swimming. Really, mother? How can you learn how to swim without frailing and flailing around a little, right? You have to get in the water. None of us like to feel like we're being humiliated. And yet that's what a firing is. It is a public humiliation. But here's what I found. And let me, and I want to say this now because I, I'm thinking of it. I hope maybe I'll repeat it. Is that Humiliation is not that bad a thing unless you have no one who loves you. If people around you love you, then humiliation can be a transformative experience. When I was fired, I learned something I would never have learned. I promise you I'd have lived and died and only in theory believed this to be true. I've always believed that the church of Jesus Christ is the most important movement on the planet. I've given my life to it. Paul and I committed our life to it very early. I've been a pastor. I have, been, I have stood and, and on some Sunday somewhere and spoken for God every Sunday of my life, except two or three when I... Had no place to go. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And as much as we believe in the church, the one thing I, I, I wanted to always keep in theory, and that is this. You've heard me say this before. It is really, 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 really important that you find a church and commit to it so that in it you can find and form and forge over time meaningful relationships. Because here's the problem. Meaningful relationships are never formed in crisis. When they teach you how, for example, I took life-saving in college. And one of the things they taught us is never, ever, ever let a drowning man or woman take hold of you or they'll pull you down, right? So here's what happens. We, particularly those of us who call ourselves Christians, we bounce around from church to church because ain't no church perfect enough for us, amen? So we just bounce around. We're doing okay. Life is good. We got cash. We just, life is, you know, we're just coming to church when we feel like it. We come to get our cup filled up, but our cup is pretty large evidently because we don't come much. So we just kind of, you know, everything is great. Then our life falls apart and we go to a church, an emergency, hair on fire. And everyone looks at us like, what planet did you fall down from? And we walk out of church, see that church is a bunch of stuck up people. They just want to go to lunch. No, it's because you haven't, in the good times, and in the strong points of your life, poured into the lives of others who are going through hell. So that when you're going through your hell, it's really hard to get a handle to you because you're so freaking hot. You're so touchy. It's really difficult. So here's my point. Find and commit to a community of faith. Stay committed to it because trust me, when you go through your hell, you're going to need them. When I went through mine, the church worked for me. Literally thousands of emails, literally, in four weeks of I never thanked you. You married me. You were there for my mother in the hospital. Stuff I totally have forgotten doing. People came around me, loved me, took care of me and Paula. And so the church, where I would never have wanted to ever put myself in a position where I needed the church to work for me. Right? I want to be the pastor. I don't need no help. I'm a superior Christian. I, I do all this stuff perfect. I master everything I talk about. Ask my family about that one. <laughs> Humiliation isn't that bad if you've got loving people around you, helping you, encouraging you, consoling you, and sometimes, quite honestly, kicking you in the butt. Because it's in that moment you need the strong courage of good friends. Ooh, ooh, somebody, somebody tweet that. The strong courage of good friends. I just made that up. See, I just, it's a gift. <laughs> Tell my family that, and I think they're, they're not appreciating my gift quite as much. There's also not just a fear of humiliation, there's a fear of isolation. I mean, for all the whining, complaining, we do, I get up in the morning, get in the car, I gotta get on the, you know, get on the 65 and go to work or 40 or 24 or, or, or Broadway Park. But you know what? You get up, you go to work. And you know, if you have a parking place that may have your name on it, or if you've seen people out at lunch and you got all these name tags and stuff, they look so official. When they fire you, they take those things back. <laughs> I mean, a place where you were once welcomed, now there's a police officer saying, get your butt off the premises or we will haul you to jail. That's a new experience for a pastor to have, I'll tell you that right now. That's not fun. You don't write home to mother and say, oh, mother, I just met the police officer today. <laughs> you're locked out of your office. You're locked out of the building. You're locked away from relationships. Oftentimes, you're even locked away from stuff that you own that you can't get back because they're scared you're going to go postal. <laughs> right? You know, you know, it's a fear of isolation. You get up in the morning and you're there. Nowhere to go, nothing to do. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. What do I do with myself? Where do I go? And it's a terrible feeling to get up and not to have to be at work by eight 
or to have some expectations and responsibilities. Those are boundaries. And all of a sudden, you have no boundaries. You have to sit and find your own boundaries. But I think if you were to just cut them all really down to the practical fear of being fired, I'd have to say it's the fear of being cut off. Just to be cut off. No salary, no paycheck, no insurance, no retirement. I mean, you're cut off, man. And your worst fear is, even when you have a job, your worst fear is something's going to happen. I'll raise my head. Somebody will notice me. They'll fire me. And I'll end up living in a van down by the river. <laughs> Never mind the promises of God that he will supply our needs according to his riches and glory. Never mind the testimony of the great King David when he says, I have been young and old. I've never seen God's elect forsaken or begging bread. Never mind all those promises of God. We still carry the fear of the orphan. It's the orphan wound. I'll be orphaned. No one will love me. No one will take care of me. And yet listen to Psalm 68. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him evermore. His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. He sets the fatherless in families. He takes up the defense of the widows. I mean, this is a God who takes it personal. I've often said, if you don't take it personal, when someone hurts you, God will. Let him be your defender. And yet we have these fears, the fear of isolation, fear of humiliation, the fear of being cut off, the fear of failure. So what do we do when we are fired, when something ends? Listen to this out of Ecclesiastes 5. When God gives any man wealth and possession. Now the key word there is gives. When God, everything you have is, is God's, right? The breath you take, the body you enjoy, the money you have. Every week when we come together, we worship God through song and through offering. And we bring our offerings to God. Now, why do we do that? First of all, we do it to acknowledge to God that you are the giver of every, everything. Everything, every dime and dollar, every breath, every day, every good thought, every, every promise, every hope is, originates with God. He's a good, giving, generous God. Yay, God. Amen. Don't just, if you're going to clap... Go, yeah, man, I believe that. I don't say it out loud like that because it'll, it'll scare me. And he enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot in life and be happy in his work. This is a gift from God. You better believe it's a gift from God. Listen, to do the work you love, where you want to be, with the people you love, that is ultimate success. And yet how many of us just drag through life? Those of you who still have your jobs, you did, well, I got to go get a job. I just said, I don't get up. I love what Vince Lombardi, the great legendary coach, said. If you aren't fired with enthusiasm, you will be fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> so how do you turn fired into fired up, Right? How do you take this, this hell that sometimes you go through and turn it on its ear? Let me give you some suggestions, some steps. This is through personal experience. One, when you get fired, it's a chance to lose weight. Because <laughs> you don't have any money for food. No, that's not what I'm saying. Hebrews 12, let us draw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. You know, like I know, that when you start through life, you kind of lean and mean, you know, you don't have much. Remember the days when you rented an apartment over a garage and you're glad to have it? 
And now when the lawn boy, you know, doesn't trim the, the flower bed just right, you cuss and fuss and kick, you know. Remember where you came from and you didn't have anything? And here's what happened. We start out kind of lean and mean, and then we, when we accumulate stuff, right, we get stuff. We get a, we get a timeshare in Florida that we don't use, praise Jesus, <laughs> and can't sell, praise the Lord. Then we get more stuff and we move our cars into the driveway so we can put our stuff in our garage. We shouldn't call them driveways. We ought to call them parkways. Amen? Come on. We got stuff. We got commitments. We got payments. But now we got automatic payments. And I always just go somewhere. We got phone contracts for our phones and we got new phones and photo phones and phones that will hover. The new iPhone 5 will hover, Dave Sheldon. <laughs> and you will not have one and I will. <laughs> and I will be smarter than you. But when you get fired, when you, when, you, know, you don't go to work anymore. You don't go to work anymore. You just, uh, all this stuff is gone, man. You don't have to go to the trade show. You don't have to eat, you know, rubber chickens at the, the family Christmas dinner. So, man, all of a sudden now you just, you, you've, you're lean, man. It's a chance to just let go of stuff that just attached itself to you. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. But it's more weight. You know what I'm saying? It's just more stuff. Let it go. You cut it away. Secondly, it's a chance to start smarter. One of the great things about being created in the image of God is God created us thinking beings, which means that we can always change and get better because our brain, it has limitless potential for information to get smarter. Smarter, smarter, smarter. Intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open to knowledge, giving their gift. Uh, their gift then makes them, gives them access to important people. Proverbs 18, 15. Intelligent people are always ready to learn. God's people are always ready to learn. Here's the thing about what we learn when we're fired. And here it is. We are great at hello. We suck at goodbye. And yet we do as much of the latter as the former. And when we're forced to say goodbye, we're forced to sit there and look and ask ourselves, why are we where we are? And what are we supposed to do? And what are we supposed to learn? Right? Here's what I learned when I got fired. No one, I can be fired from a job. No one can fire me from my life's work. When I got fired, I met with an NFL football coach whose name will stay anonymous. And I said, what am I going to do? And he looked at me like I was an idiot, and said, well, you're going to be my pastor. You've been my pastor. You're going to be my pastor until you tell me you don't want to be my pastor. Ain't nobody going to tell me who might be my pastor except you. I said, oh, you make it sound so simple. <laughs> I met with another prominent leader whose name will go in. And, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, na- I, don't like, I don't like the name drop, Financial Peace University. I don't like the name drop. <laughs> And Paul and I said, you know, what are we going to do? And this great wise deposit of wisdom says, well, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be a pastor. He says, problem solved. <laughs> I can see why you have such success, O Obi-Wan Kenobi. My point is, really wise people told me what I already knew. I can be fired from a job, you can be fired from a job, but nobody can fire me from my life's work. Writers write, leaders lead, teachers teach, musicians make music. That's why I love in this town, we're full of crazy musicians who know what it really means to be called to something that doesn't make any sense to anyone but them. And yet I dare anyone in this room 
who's being honest to say there hasn't been a pivotal moment in your life that a song and the words of that song have somehow transfixed, transported, or transformed your life. Amen. See, we we put way too much emphasis on a joyless obligation box. Job. Right? Here's another chance. It's a chance. I don't know if I have time for this one or not because this is the most convicting one of them. It's a chance to get better. So let me just say this so I can get get it over. I said it once and it didn't taste good then. When you get fired, it's always all their fault. You don't contribute ever. Right? Right. Yeah. And monkeys fly, right? Well, the truth of the matter is when you go through, when you lose a job, when you're getting fired, or you call it whatever you want to call it, when you're terminated, you have to ask yourself if you have any intelligence whatsoever. What did I contribute? Did I contribute to this? And the answer is, you did. Here's what we usually do. We go to two extremes. I either accept no responsibility for what happened to me, or I accept all the responsibility for what happened to me, neither of which usually is true. But you have to ask yourself and say, God, where in this Am I culpable? Where in this did I contribute? How did I contribute? Let me see. Here's 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 what's really crazy about this. No one sets out to be stupid and dumb and self-destructive. But we often end up there driven by unhealthy beliefs and passions and unmet needs in our soul. Are you with me? If you see yourself differently than how you're portraying yourself publicly, you will self-destruct. You will sabotage yourself. Ask yourself, God, where in this did I contribute? So I step back, ask myself, where in this did I contribute? And I found way too much stuff I didn't like. Taking for granted the privilege I've been given. Way too critical. My feeling was, you know what? People just love me because I try to entertain them. I make them laugh. I give them a little sermon and they, and they go away. They don't care about me. All of that was the lies that we spin and tell ourselves. And all of a sudden, we become arrogant, self-absorbed. And so ask yourself. How do I need to change as a human being? What work do I need to do in my soul so that I can gain on my demons, so that I can become the kind of man I should have been when I had the chance? And then God will give you another chance. But if you just say, boy, it's just all of them. They're just terrible people. They're evil. God, I hope God kills them and their children and their grandparents and their dogs and all the grass in their yard. (laughs) Then you're the loser. No wonder you got fired with that attitude. Listen to this. Proverbs 22. Do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. Yes. Yes. Take the promises of God and say, God, how can I become more skilled? So that's the next point. It's a chance to sharpen your skills. Over time, let's be honest. When you get a job and you start doing your job, let's be, come on, let's all be honest. There comes a point where you can do that thing in your sleep. You just kind of show up and get it done. And you're taking breaks upon breaks because you don't have enough. You're bored. And you want them to give you more, but you're, I mean, you've got, seriously, you've got it down, man. You know how to get it done. And here's what, or you have the other side, is that you're working so hard just to keep your head above water. You're just using that ax, chopping away at that tree. Chop, 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 chop. Every day, chopping at that tree, baby. And your ax is dull, right? Axes get dull. 
Is this new news to anyone? And then they have to be sharpened. Why is it that we value, 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 highly value the chopping of the axe, but we devalue the sharpening of the axe? What did you do today? I read a book. Well, I wish I could read a book. No, you don't. Because if you did, you would. I had people say, I don't read books. I said, you know what? You do not have to tell us. <laughs> We've already figured it out. So when... So you ask yourself, how can I sharpen my skill? How can I be a reader? How can I be a learner? How can I get valuable information? Now, my time, I don't have to chop, chop, chop every day. Here's what happens. When we don't chop, 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 chop every day, at it working all the time, then we just sit around. What am I supposed to do? Sharpen the axe, dude. But for the next round of chopping, Amen. Sharpen that act because you may not have time to sharpen it then because you're going to be at the job. Sharpen that act. Make yourself valuable because you're sharpening, sharpening, sharpening your skills. Here's the next one. It's a chance to reinvent yourself. You ever wanted to look different, be different, dye your hair, get some hair? <laughs> Now's the time. Right? Seriously. You got more time to take care of yourself. How many of us have said, boy, you know what? I just wish I could lose a few pounds. It's hard. Let's be honest. It's hard to fit exercise into the modern American week of getting up and going and doing. And particularly, you have kids. You have a lot of responsibility. All of a sudden, you don't have any. And here's what we usually do when we get fired. Stay home and get depressed. Sit around. Watch you know, leave it to beaver reruns and eat ho-hos. But you got to get up, you got to move constantly. I said in the very beginning of this, of this series is that what do you do when you're going through hell? You move, man. You just get up every day. You get up, suit up, show up and do the next right thing. That's all you got to do. You move one foot in front of the other. If that's all you can do, do that. Amen. If you can just from the, get from the couch to the toilet and that's all you can do, praise God. We, as a matter of fact, we're thankful that you can. Right? How do you run a marathon? You get up off your butt and walk out to the mailbox. Amen? And then you walk a little further and you walk a little further and you walk a little further. And you constantly, you're reinventing yourself. You say, boy, I want to be, I want a different reputation. Good. You can have one. Let somebody fire you, the old you goes away, and the new you shows up. Amen? The happier you. You say, well, I'm not happy. Fake it. God will forgive you. We'll all thank you. <laughs> all right? You get fired, the same old you. you does, does, it, does anyone want that you? You don't even want that you. So you can change your mind, change your attitude, change your appearance. You can start dressing nice. Color coordinating wouldn't hurt some of you. I can't see anybody, so don't. I'm not talking about anybody, except this guy up here on the left side of the <coughs> How about this? It's a chance to be thankful. Anyone who is among the living has hope. I like that. Anyone. Hope never dies. I hope that you, someone, when, when I went, was fired, I got a letter. The reason I, the title of the, of the talk today is, you know, a hell call service is no longer required. I got this letter delivered to me by what I thought was my, one of my best friends. And it says, the very first sentence is, we, we, we regret to inform you, your service is no longer required. I said, well, Really? That's, that's not good. <laughs> and it was a very hopeless moment. But I never lost hope. One of the reasons I never lost hope because Paula wouldn't permit it. And my children wouldn't permit it. My friends wouldn't permit it. Sometimes, I like what the great theologian Walt Disney said. You may not realize it when it happens, but a kick in the teeth may be the best thing in the world for you. 
The guy who delivered that letter said that to me that night. One of these days, you're going to thank me. Well, I have to say that that day arrived a long time ago that I thank God for that help. But I'm never thanking him. Don't ever, I'm never going to let him know. <laughs> Leaving that sucker in the dark. I mean, every day, do you get up and say, God, thank you for this day. Thank you that I can breathe. Thank you that I have two legs. There's a lot of wounded soldiers coming home with no legs, ladies and gentlemen. Two eyes, two ears. Got people who, can lo who love me, who care about me. Got a big old world out there, the great big uh, pile of need. I can do something, be something, reinvent myself, get smarter, go wherever. I can move somewhere else, man. I can move anywhere I want to be. That was a great thing. When I got fired, I'm like, okay, where do you want to go? Well, you want to be here. Some ask me today, are you living where you want to live? Yep, I'm living where I want to live, doing what I want to do with the people I love doing it with. That, to me, is ultimate success. I'm thankful for every day. Thankful for every Sunday. Saturday night, for me, is like Christmas. There's another, another thing that happens when you go from fire to fire up. It's a chance to stay humble or to become humble. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he'll lift you up in due season. Humiliate, humiliated to be humble? Absolutely. Humble before your God. That's the very best place you can be. Humble yourself and say, God, this is what happened to me. Forgive me for my part. Show me where I've been wrong. Show me where I have let down and failed. Help me to grow and to never fail that way and to be that way. Never, 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 never to get pride in my life over the gifts and callings you have given me to operate with love and generosity and grace. And by the way, it's also a chance to extend grace. Why is it that we trust God to get us to heaven, but doubt that he can get us through this life in one peace, one joy, and one hope? Here's a powerful truth. The person who will not be offended cannot be defeated. If you will not be offended, you cannot be defeated. Offended people are the people who walk around stooped over, cussing under their brow. <laughs> Conspiracy theories. You know, we hate Obama. We hate everybody. We hate dirt. We hate water. We hate dirty water. Just, you know, being around, being around these people. And you just say, Lord, forgive them. But you know what? If you will not be offended, you cannot be defeated. What is it that man can do? Fear of man is a snare. I didn't just make that up. That's from the Bible. If you cannot be offended, you cannot be defeated. Say that with me. If you will not be offended, you cannot be defeated. One more time. If you will not be, you cannot be defeated. Here's the last one. It's a chance to stay relevant. It's a chance to stay relevant. It's a wake-up call. It's God saying, here we go. We're going to start over again. You're going to get smarter and better, and we're going to go at this one more time. That was a great run. This is going to be a better run. Amen? Somebody said, people say to me, and I'm not begging for compliments, but people, when people say to me at the end of the service, sometime from time to time, they'll say this, you're at the top of your game. You're at the top of your game. I'm going, yeah, baby. Yeah. If I got to get kicked in the mouth in order to be more faithful to my calling, bring it on. Amen? If I got to go through hell to get to heaven, bring it on. If I got to go through hell for God to forge a fruitful, firsthand, real, genuine, deep, abiding faith in my life, bring it on. How about you? Listen, greatness with God is not obtained lightly, but it can be obtained. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will raise these men and women up to greatness, true, genuine greatness, difference makers, culture changers. I pray for someone, Father, who is in the middle of this deep, dark hell, 
of this dark night. I pray you give them grace and mercy and the help of good people to pull them through, to see the future, that they have hope, that good things, better things are just ahead. I pray that they'll turn to you and humble themselves before you, allow you to forgive and to transform their soul, that you will open up doors of opportunity they can't even begin to understand, that you will show them favor, that you will make them generous, grateful, and gracious to the glory of God. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Go get them. God bless you. I like it, and I like it, yeah.